morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class on Christology. Uh, we're going to be studying chapter 10 this uh, morning. Uh, last week, we looked at chapter 9. Uh, we studied uh, Jesus's, or we looked at Jesus's title and role as the sinless Lamb of God. Okay. Um, and we looked at how Jesus is referred to as the Passover lamb. Uh, so the Old Testament feast of the Passover was a type and shadow, okay, of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ uh, that we see in the New Testament. We also see that uh, Jesus offered himself uh, for the sacrifice of sins forever. He did it once and for all. And uh, the reason why he could do this was because he was, he was sinless. Yes, he was sinless. He was holy. He was undefiled. Okay. And we saw that even as he offered himself as a sacrifice, he brought an end to the daily sacrifices, both the morning and the evening sacrifices, uh, because he was able to do this because he was fully surrendered and fully consecrated to the father we also saw jesus as the suffering lamb right we studied jesus as a suffering lamb um, and he was oppressed he was afflicted uh, he was reviled reviled means he was criticized he was uh, um, he was opposed he was said unpleasant things but he did not retaliate so we see that this sinless lamb of god jesus christ you know, very willingly, submissively, passively, you know, bore the penalty for our sins, okay? And uh, he became that suffering lamb so that he could make his life as an trespass offering, okay? So uh, what is another word for trespass offering? Guilt offering, yes. So what happens, what are the two things that uh, a person does when they have to in the guilt offering, atonement and restitution. Very good. So we see that Jesus made the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And he also paid the penalty. Okay. He paid uh, for our sins. He made restitution for our sins. So this morning we're going to um, look at chapter 10, the substitutionary suffering. Before we begin... Uh, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Esther Clement, are you there? Can you, okay, okay, Pratt, please go ahead. Yes, I'm there, sister. Yeah, can you please lead us in uh, prayer? Yes. Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, God, we praise and thank you for this morning time, Lord, this wonderful opportunity you have given us, Lord, to know more about you and Lord, to transform in your likeness, oh Lord God. Lord, we commit this time of learning into your hands, Lord, uh, bless your sister, Lord, as she is, Lord, uh, uh, Lord uh, giving the lecture, oh Lord, help us to, Lord, imbibe it and Lord God, uh, Lord, practice them and Lord God, uh, Lord, ponder and Lord God have a lot, a lot of uh, Lord learning that which 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 will Lord God transform us and Lord make us in Your likeness. Thank you, Father God. We commit this time into Your hands, and we ask this in the mighty and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Esther Clement. So um, we're going to uh, study chapter ten today: the substitutionary suffering of. Jesus Christ. Now, what is the meaning of substitution? Huh? Replacing, okay. What else? Instead of. Instead of, yes. Basically, the meaning of substitution is uh, it's an act, it's a process, a result of uh, substituting or replacing instead of one thing for an other, okay. So when we're talking about Christ's suffering, uh, you know, or we, we are studying about Christ's suffering, uh, we'll be focusing on his substitutionary work on the cross. So what do we mean when we say uh, Christ's substitutionary work on the cross? What, what do we mean by that? 
what do you understand or what do we mean when we say Christ substitutionary suffering on the cross? Means he took our place. Okay, he took our place. You can use the mic if you want to speak. He took our place. Yes, thank you, Mr. Gertrude. The sin we did, uh, he took for us. Okay, he took upon himself our sins. Uh, he replaced us in our place. He died in our place. He took our sins. Uh, what else? What else? What else did he do on the cross in our place? He took our sickness, our grief, our pain. Okay, he took upon himself our sickness, our grief, our pain. Uh, he took our iniquities and transgressions upon himself. He delivered us. He gave us the victory. Yes, he took upon himself our curse. Okay. Uh, he gave back what belonged to us. Yes. He gave back our authority. He fulfilled the requirement for our atonement. Yes. Thank you. Anything else? So, yes, he was made a curse for us. Okay. He uh, carried our sorrows. Uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Uh, he bore our sins and he took the penalty for our sins or the consequences for our sins. That is death. Okay? He died in our place, which means he died for the sins of the entire mankind. Okay. So when we say, when we talk about Christ's substitutionary suffering, it's basically Christ taking our place. Uh, doing what we should have done, okay, bearing what we should have borne, suffering for what we should have suffered, and paying for what we had to pay for, okay. So, um, you know, when Christ made that sacrifice, he was identifying on behalf of us. That is why he had to be fully man. So he was fully man and fully God. Fully man, because he was making that substitutionary sacrifice. He was uh, doing it in our place. So if he had to substitute for us, he had to become like one of us, like one among us, okay? And uh, he had to make the sacrifice on our behalf. So the one making the sacrifice uh, was suffering for all of our pains, all of our, pun taking all of our punishment, okay, and uh, taking upon the consequences for our sins, okay. Now, why did Christ do this for us? Why did he, Christ have to do this for us? Why did he have to suffer on our place, on our behalf? So that we can take his place, okay. Why did Christ have to do this for us? That we are set free from the eternal death. Yes, so that we are set free from eternal death and we have eternal life, okay? Lucy says for our righteousness and justification, yes. What else? To make us right with God. To make us right with God, okay? Uh, Sanjay says there's no other way to reconcile sinful man with a holy God. Yes. And he also did it. Hello, Shaker. Can you? <laughs> I'm sorry, 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 sorry. You know, no problem. Okay. Okay, he uh, did it for us. Look at what Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 to 6 says. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 to 6. Can somebody read that please? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he has wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. And all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
Amen. Thank you. So here in Isaiah chapter 53, it basically, uh, verse 4 to 6 speaks, uh, it gives details of Christ's substitutionary work. Okay. So if you look at verses 4 and 5, what is the word that is repeated again and again? Yes, R. Okay. He bore our grief. He carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment needed to obtain our peace was upon him. Okay. He took a, by his stripes, he provided us healing. Okay. His stripes provided our healing. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Okay. So the Lord laid on him our iniquity. So if you look at the word that is repeated again and again is the word our, which means Christ, whatever he did on the cross, he did it for us. He did it in our place. He did it on behalf of us. And this is the substitutionary suffering. Yes. To differentiate between a transgression and an iniquity. Yes. No, iniquity, we know it's a sin that we know okay. and we still commit. Okay. So how is transgression different from, from iniquity. iniquity? Okay, good question. How is transgression different from iniquity? Any thoughts? Anyone has? How is transgression dif different from iniquity? Uh, Lucy says, our actions. Okay. Okay, transgression is basically that, you know, is something that is against a command or a law. When you go against a command or, or a law, whether you're cheating in a test or you're cheating on your spouse or you're, com you're basically committing transgression and that's not easily forgiven. Okay, so transgression is basically... Uh, 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 when you fail in your duty, okay? So uh, a sin is a transgression because it is against God. So basically sin is when you're failing in your duty, you're going again against the command or a law. And it can be anything, whether you're cheating as simple as, you might think it's a simple thing to cheat in a test, but whether you're cheating in a test, or che you know, you're cheating on your spouse, you are basically committing transgression, which is not forgiven. So what is the word, uh, you know, we, we read in the Bible in various places, iniquity. Now, iniquity is, uh, is defined as being uh, immoral or being wicked. Okay, it's being actually wicked or immoral in your nature or your character. Okay, so it primarily, uh, this word iniquity is not an action. It's not an action that you do. It's basically the character of your action. Okay, so iniquity is the character of your action. It's defined as being wicked or it's the immoral in nature or character. And it basically indicates not an action, but it is basically talking the ca your character of your action. And that is where, where it is distinguished from sin, so how it is distinguished from uh, sin. But basically, if you look in the, in the New Testament, there are 12 basic words to describe the word sin itself. And iniquity is not one of those. Uh, transgression is one of those. So what are some of the, the words in the New Testament that is used to uh, describe sin? We have uh, bad, uh, karkos, that is in Greek. Then we have poniros, which is evil. We have godless. We have guilt. Uh, we have... Uh, Amartya in Greek word, which is basically in some places the New Testament talks about sin. Um, unrighteousness also is referring to sin. Then we have lawlessness. We have transgression, uh, ignorance, uh, to go astray, uh, to fall away, uh, hypocrisy, or uh, to be a hypocrite. All are words that are used to describe sin in the New Testament. But this word iniquity is not there. And that is how it is distinguished from sin, sin, because it's basically your character, not more of your action. But your character eventually results in your action. Is that... Uh... 
Okay, it's a good question. Thank you. So here we see that, you know, uh, everything that, you know, Christ did on the cross for us, uh, which is, is spoken of in Isaiah 53, shows that he has done it on behalf of us. So Christ's substitutionary work on the cross was on behalf of us, for us. Okay, he suffered for us. Now, if you look at the first uh, uh, phrase there, he bore our grief, or he has borne our grief, B-O-R-N-E. Now, what is the word or the meaning of this word bore or bone? Uh, the Hebrew word for this is basically to remove, uh, to distance away, to cast away, to take away, uh, to lift up, okay? So that is what it means when it says he bore our grief. That means he cast away our grief or he uh, he took it away, he removed it, uh, he distanced it from us, okay? Now, what are the things that he bore for us? According to Isaiah chapter 53, what are the things Jesus bore for us on the cross? Griefs, sorrows, yes, our transgressions, our iniquities, yes, and our chastisement. What is chastisement? A punishment. Okay. Now, what is the meaning of he bore our grief? The Greek word for bore our grief is basically sickness. That means Jesus on the cross, he removed our sickness. He lifted it away. He took it away. He cast it away. So I think that should give us so much more of a uh, assurance, um, uh, you know, uh, just being so grateful and thankful that on the cross, Jesus bore our sickness, which means he lifted it up. He took it away. He cast it away. He threw out all your sicknesses. He, he removed it to a distance. Okay. So when you are sick and you're suffering with sickness in your body, you need to declare this word in Isaiah chapter 53, that he has borne our grief which means he has borne our sickness, okay? And he has, uh, uh, what, what, uh, he has carried our sorrows. What is the meaning of sorrows? The Hebrew word is pain, okay? Actually, if you study Hebrew and Greek, the whole Bible will just come alive in such a different way. Now, when you look at grief, what do we think? What do we, when you, uh, when you look at grief, what do you understand about grief? Sadness, sorrow, basically, right? You're crying, you're mourning the death of somebody or you're sad about something. But did you know that grief was basically sickness? And sorrows is, what is sorrows? You know, heartache, brokenness or whatever, but here it is our pain, all the pain that we are carrying, you know, he has borne it, which means he has cast it away, he has lifted it up, he has taken it away. Which means, what does it mean when we read this verse that Jesus has removed distance, lifted away, carried away, cast away our sickness and pain? What does it tell you? What should it do to you? What should be your response? What should be your response? Grateful, thankful, okay. Can it move a little more beyond that? Confident that it's been taken away from you, yes. What else? Some of us love to live in pain and grief and sickness, right? We think pain and sickness is so much part and parcel of our life, we just carry it. We carry it on us. Like, you know, we, nobody can share it, nobody can take it away. And it, uh, it just pulls us down. But here we need to come to a place where we're saying, God, you've taken it away. You have you suffered. You know, Jesus suffered for us. He went through so much of agony and pain uh, to take our sickness, to take our pain and our brokenness. So it's not worth carrying. Yes, we need to rejoice. We need to celebrate. But it's not worth carrying, right? Because he's already taken away. He's cast it away. Then why are you holding on to it? It can be such a lie of the enemy that we are believing and living, okay? So, yes, no more sickness, no more sorrows, no more failures. You need to declare. Now, 
Christ has finished everything on the cross, but it's very important for us to believe that and to live that out in our lives. We need to live and walk in that truth. That's when it becomes what Christ has done on the cross becomes a reality in our lives. Yes or no? Otherwise, you know, he's done everything and 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 you're crying out to God, God, why are we carrying all this pain? Why this sorrow, the sickness? I'm living with this. Why God? Why God? And God is saying, hey, look at the cross. I've already done it on the cross. I've already taken away. Can you just let it go? Can you just trust me? Can you just walk in that freedom in what Christ has uh, borne, has what he has done for you on the cross? Okay. So let's live in that reality, even as we are in the season of Lent, we are focusing on the cross. Let the cross become more of a reality of what Christ has done on the cross and become the, let it become something that we are living it out in our own lives. Okay. So if you look at the various translations, the Young's translation of Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4 says, Surely our sickness he had borne and our pains he has carried them okay so rotherham's translation says surely our sickness he carried and as for our pain he bears the burden of them all okay so we see that christ has borne it for us so we don't have to bear it when something is taken away from us we need to live in freedom walk need to walk in freedom and need to exercise and live in that truth amen can't hear any amen Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so the Bible teaches us that, you know, um, Jesus substitutionary work on the cross, you know, he bore our sickness, he bore our pain, our sins and our punishment. Uh, Jesus took it all upon himself. He carried them away. Therefore, we don't need to bear it any longer. We don't have to carry that on ourselves. So I don't know how many of you are carrying heavy burdens, backpacks, luggages, suitcases loaded with all your pain, sorrows, brokenness, heartaches. We all go through that. It's a reality. But we need to just let it go. Right? We just have to let it go. And because Christ has already taken it on the cross and has set us free. Okay? Therefore, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Amen. Okay. So we have forgiveness of sins, healing of our bodies. We have shalom. What is shalom? Not just peace, peace but wholeness. Okay. It's wholeness. It's peace, but it's wholeness. It's a very comprehensive uh, word uh, to make it more real in our context. A very pregnant word. That means it's a word that is full. Okay. Uh, so much of meaning in that it's a holistic word, comprehensive word. Uh, he brings us shalom, our completeness for our entire uh, being, our entire person. Okay. And all this is because of the substitutionary work of Jesus on the cross. Okay. Um, now, people say that, you know, or many people who look at Christ's suffering on the cross say, that his vicarious suffering or his substitutionary suffering. What's the meaning of vicarious? Sorry? Vicarious extreme. Another word for uh, vicarious or vicarious is basically substitutionary, okay? In the place of another, okay? Say that it was very unjust. What do you think? Christ's vicarious suffering was very, or substitutionary suffering was very unjust. What do you think? Any thoughts? It was unjust for him to go through that, but it is justified for the sins that we have committed as a whole world. So okay. for God being so holy in his sight, it was just, but for Christ, it was unjust because he was blameless. Okay. Good thought. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? What do you think? The substitutionary suffering thing was unjust? 
Now there are yes, two. It was unjust. Sorry, Warren. Please go ahead. Sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah, it was unjust because he did. You know, Christ didn't have to do that for us because he was blameless. He was innocent, uh, and you know, actually, we don't deserve. We didn't deserve that he gave up his life and suffered for us. Okay, thank you, Warren. Now uh, there are two reasons why people go through suffering in this world. What are the two reasons? One starts with J, the other starts with L. <laughs> the second letter. <laughs> okay, the first word J, okay, a lack of knowledge, okay. J-U. We are, the, the first one is justice, okay. Uh, you know, we suffer because we have done things that are wrong. We are not innocent, okay? And we live in a world that is not, which is full of evil, it's not innocent. So we suffer justly for what we have done, okay? And the second thing that people can suffer is because of love, right? Here in this context, you know, we see that Christ suffered because he had to justify us, okay, for justice reason. And also we see God's demonstration of love, okay. And uh, the cross shows us the, the full extent of Christ's love or defines love for us. Greater love has no man than this, than a man who lay down his life for his friends, okay. So we see that um, it was not unjust, but he did it because of the justice that was required for our sin and also out of love. Okay, just, just a side note. Just wanted to do, um, ask you all and talk about it. Okay, so we see that Christ uh, suffered in our place. So the substitutionary suffering of Christ was because he loved us. He did it out of love for us. Okay. And we see scriptures also revealing that it was God's love that prompted Christ's substitutionary suffering. Okay, so which is a passage that we can talk about God's love and substitutionary suffering? The famous verse. John 3.16. Yeah, thank you, Warren. John 3.16, God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Uh, look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. So can three of you please read this uh, verses, please? Romans 5, 8, 1 John 3, 16, and 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yes. How did God demonstrate his love for us? How did Christ demonstrate his love for us? By dying on the cross while we were still sinners. Okay. Which means that we are not worthy of his love. We are not worthy of anything, but he did it out of his love. Okay. 1 John 3.16. Can somebody read that please? By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Amen. So how do we know Christ's love? Because he gave his life for us. Okay, Second Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, please. Hey, the love. Christ's love controls. Go ahead, controls we believe that Christ died for all. We also believe that we have all died in our own life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was Christ for them. Amen. Thank you. So here we see in these three scripture passages that Christ died for us. He died for you and for me. That for everyone, he laid down his life for us. 
and one died for all okay so this is one who died and made that uh, perfect sacrifice once for all forever for the sins of mankind and he died for all okay so these statements basically reveal christ's suffering his death and it says that it's for us and it was made once and for all and that is why we don't need to make any more sacrifices okay so this was christ's substitutionary suffering and his substitutionary death okay we also see that these scriptures reveal that it was done out of god's love for us it was god's love that prompted you know christ's substitutionary suffering so when christ died on the cross he was basically displaying okay, he was demonstrating he was showing the love that he has for us by giving his life for us or taking our place or taking our punishment so when he was doing all of this he was basically displaying he was basically demonstrating his love for us okay and again john chapter 15 verse 13 says what does john chapter 15 verse 13 say somebody read that please John chapter 15 verse 13 greater love has no one uh, than greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends amen thank you angeline so we see that um, you know he laid down his life for us because he loved us and uh, so what should be our response to this what should be our response to this what does this verse say in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 5, verse 15? And 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. What should be our response? Can you please use the mic? In the verse it says it's, we should no longer live for ourselves, but for our brethren. Yes, we uh, no longer live for ourselves, but we live for Jesus. Christ. Okay, we we show Christ likeness in um, the way that we live, in our attitudes, in the way that we serve, in our actions, in our behavior. Okay, because He laid down His life for us, we also lay down our lives for our brethren, which means we also serve one another, helpful to one another. Yes, Lucy, thank you and also that we are no longer living for ourselves which means what what does it mean we no longer live for ourselves as it says in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 15 what does it mean okay what does it mean when you say that we are no longer living for ourselves that means we should be selfless okay yes selfless no, live, no longer living for our sinful, sinful or lustful desires, pleasures and passions. Okay. Remember Paul is talking about a war in our, in our bodies. Yes. Yes or no. What is the war in our bodies that is going on constantly? The flesh and the, the spirit. Yes. Our fleshly nature, fleshly carnal nature and our spirit nature, they're constantly in war with each other so you know we don't give in to our sinful passions and desires okay not yielding to our own will to our own thoughts but yielding and submitting totally to god okay so we no longer live for ourselves but for uh, him okay uh, a few more scripture passages we can look at is galatians chapter 2 verse 20 okay where it says, uh, Paul is saying, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. So here Paul is making a bold statement. He's saying, I've been crucified with Christ. What is he saying? What does he mean when he says, I've been crucified with Christ? Was he crucified along with Christ on the cross? What does he mean when he says, I've been crucified with Christ? Yes, he's, he's saying that my sinful, fleshly, carnal nature has been put to death. And I no longer live for myself, but I live for 
Christ. Okay. Um, look at what Romans chapter 14 verses 7 and 8 says. Can somebody read that please? Romans chapter 14 verse 7 to 8. Romans chapter 14, verse 7 and 8. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we, if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Yes, so whether we live or die, we are the Lord's, or we belong to the Lord. Thank you, Angeline. So here it's uh, uh, one beautiful scripture verse where it says, you know, we live and we die for the Lord. Everything that we do, we do for Him. Uh, in Him, we live, move, and have our being. Okay? So He should be the Lord of our life and not just our Savior, but also the Lord of our life. Look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20 says. Anyone knows that by heart? It's a very familiar scripture passage. Don't you know your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Yes, who is in you and you have received it from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, what do you do? Honor or glorify God in your bodies or with your bodies. So I just want you to think, who are you living for? You know, are you living just to, you know, for your family? To earn, to feed your family, to take care of your family, or you're living just because you have to live, or you're living with, uh, you know, with certain plans, goals that you have that you want to achieve. You know, are are you or everything in your life is aligned to uh, what God has planned and purpose for your life, and you're living to glorify Him, you're living to honor Him. Whatever you're doing, you know. Ask yourself this question, am I doing it to honor God? Am I doing it to glorify God? Because he gave us his everything. He took our place, you know. Um, he demonstrated and displayed his love for us. And all he is asking in return is our love for him. And our love for him in every area of our lives. Okay. We'll move on. Um, Christ's substitutionary suffering on the cross uh, also, you know, brought about our justification, okay? Uh, when he was raised to life, that's when we were justified. Now, I want all of you to pay attention. This is something very important, okay? Uh, please read Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Romans chapter 4, verse 25, please, someone. Who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification? Amen. So I want you all to listen carefully. That it says, who was delivered up because of our offenses? Who is the who here? Jesus. Jesus was delivered for our offenses. Offenses means sins. Sin. Okay. Yes. Our sins were what caused him to be de de delivered up. Means what? Delivered up means what? Gave himself. Okay, gave himself, crucified on the cross. Yes, he gave himself, he was crucified on the cross. And uh, he took upon himself the consequences of our offenses. Okay, this is the substitutionary work that Christ did on the cross. Now, what does it mean he was delivered up for our offenses? Now, if you look at the ancient Greek, this word delivered, you know, when it's translated, basically means was it basically gives this idea, or it's used in this context of casting people into prison or delivering them to justice. So when you're caught in a in a sin, they would take you and deliver you up to the court for justice, or you would be cast into prison. So this is the idea that this ancient Greek word delivered had. Okay. So here, in this context, it speaks of the judicial act of God the Father delivering the Son, you know, to justice that was required for the payment of the penalty of our sin. Okay, I'll repeat that again. I want you all to listen carefully. Now, this word delivered in ancient Greek had this whole meaning 
of when somebody did something wrong, casting them into prison. That's basically punishing them or being delivering up them up to justice. You know, taking them to court and then justice being done, punishment given to them. So here, when we talk that you know Jesus was delivered up, you know, for our because of our offenses, it basically means it was God the Father who was the judge. He is the judge, and in his you know, judicial act, he delivered the son to the justice that was required for the payment of the penalty of sins. Okay, so when Christ went through the substitutionary suffering, it was basically justice that had to be done for the payment of the penalty of human sin. Okay, did you all understand that? No? All of us are sinful, we all stand before the court of God, and when God looks at each one of us, he declares us sinful, okay? And that is what we were in his eyes. But when Jesus, but the penalty for sin had to be paid. So in the Old Testament, what, how was sin atoned for? The lamb that was sacrificed, the blood that would atone for the sins or cover, okay? So when, when Jesus made that sacrifice, God the Father was delivering up the Son to justice. That means he is a just God. Justice had to be done. Punishment had to be paid for the penalty of human sin. And so when he was delivering up his Son on the cross, okay, he was basically doing justice and Christ was paying the penalty for our sins. He was making the payment for our sins. Do you all understand? Yes? No? Okay, so that is the first half of this uh, verse. Okay? The second one says, and was raised because of our justification. Very interesting, right? You find something very different here? He was raised because of our justification. What does it mean? What do you understand by this? He was raised because of our justification. What does it mean? Yes, Sanjay. Pastor, uh, God was pleased with the sacrifice of Jesus and this uh, sacrifice which Christ had made on behalf of us since, since God received this sacrifice, uh, we were justified. So in a way, if Christ wasn't risen from the dead, we wouldn't be justified. So his resurrection is, is very important for us as believers. Christ's resurrection also uh, makes us justified. Yes, thank you. Uh, good. Yes, so here we see that, you know, um, uh, interesting to know that Christ was raised because of our justification. That does not mean that because we were just people, just because we were justified that Christ was raised, it implies that when our sins were paid in full, you know, we were declared righteous in God's sight, okay? And Christ was raised. So crucifixion or the death of Christ is not, uh, uh, sorry, resurrection is not, uh, how can I say, uh, crucifixion was not complete till the resurrection of Jesus Christ or the what Christ did on the cross, in one sense, was not complete if he had not been raised back to life from the dead. Okay, so resurrection is very, very important because resurrection basically shows or, or tells us that what Christ did on the cross was something that was sufficient, was full, what was what God required, was what God looked as the payment and the penalty for our sins and what the sacrifice that Christ made, it pleased God, it appeased God. It, it covered our sins once for all. It made that full payment that was required, okay? So here, Christ's resurrection is a proof or an indication of the reality of our justification. It basically means that our sins were paid in full and we were declared righteous in God's sight. 
So this phrase, race before, uh, because of our justification, is very, very important because the resurrection has essential or it has important or crucial place in our redemption. Okay, why? Because it demonstrates God the Father's perfect satisfaction with the Son's work on the cross. Now, this is not in your notes, so if you want to take it down, you can take it down. So here we see that resurrection has an essential or an important or a basically crucial place in our redemption because it basically demonstrates to us that God the Father's, you know, perfect satisfaction with what Jesus did on the cross um, was complete. The son's work on the cross was complete. He was perfectly satisfied. It also proves that what Jesus did on the cross was in fact a perfect sacrifice made by one who was himself perfect, even though he was bearing the sins of the world. Okay, I'll repeat that. It also proves that what Jesus did on the cross, the sacrifice that he made was perfect, and it was made by one who was perfect in every way, even though he bore the sins of the world. Okay. And uh, when Jesus was delivered up over to death because of our sins, you know, he was raised because of our justification. Our justification is accomplished in the death of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection is basically God's receipt. Okay? Or it is the Father's amen to what Jesus said. When he said on the cross, it is finished. Jesus said it is finished. But the resurrection was the father saying amen to what was finished on the cross. Or it was basically the resurrection was God's receipt for Christ's payment. Right? Whenever you go and make a payment, you just don't walk away. You ask for a receipt. Right? Because that is so important. So the resurrection in one, in the sense, if you look at it in a human way, is basically God's receipt to what Christ did on the payment that Christ made on the cross and it is paid in full. That's why we don't have to make any more sacrifices. And it's the Father's amen to what Christ said on the cross. It is finished. Okay. So it's also, uh, uh, you know, uh, he was raised because of our justification is also heaven's acceptance of the death of Christ. Okay. So without the resurrection from the dead, or Christ, without the Christ's resurrection from the dead, uh, from the dead, sorry, there is no indication that what he did was atoning and justifying. Okay, I'll repeat that again. Without the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, okay, there would have been no indication that what he did, the atoning sacrifice that he did on the cross, the justification that he made for our sins would not have been complete if there was no resurrection. So you see how important resurrection is? Yes or no? Yes. So, you know, without the resurrection from the dead, there is no indication that Christ's death was atoning and justified. Okay. But with the resurrection from the dead, Everything that Christ claimed to be doing through his death, including justifying sinners, you know, who believe has been accomplished. So resurrection is so equally important as crucifixion on the cross. So crucifixion of the cross, everything what Christ has accomplished for, our, for us on the cross, you know, uh, is completed, is done when Christ resurrected from the dead. Okay, you're able to understand anything you want me to repeat or say again or explain, sister. About resurrection, once again, sister. Okay, so um, the resurrection is basically an essential or important, crucial place in our redemption because it demonstrates God the Father's perfect satisfaction with what Christ has done on the cross. or the son's work on the cross. It was a satisfaction of Christ's work on the cross. It also proves that what Jesus did on the cross was in fact 
a perfect sacrifice that he made uh, and it was made by one who was perfect himself even though he took on the sins of the world okay and jesus was delivered up for our death because of our sins and was raised because of our justification basically resurrection is god's receipt or it's uh, the receipt for christ's payment on the cross resurrection is the father saying amen to what jesus said it is finished on the cross and it's also heaven's acceptance of the death of jesus christ okay so without the resurrection from the dead there is no indication that christ's death was atoning and justifying but with the resurrection from the dead everything that christ claimed to be doing through his death you know was accomplished that is including justifying sinners who believe okay okay everyone uh, thank you for attending class i hope these truths uh, become a reality and you live the reality thank you everyone and i'll see you on friday our in-person students are not going to be there so we'll do an online class just for an online students okay have a blessed week ahead and a blessed day thank you everyone thank you sister thank you warren thank you everyone